welcome to this lecture series on environment and ecology presented by mentors for is in association with bangalore is academy and nama kpsc so in this particular video we'll actually be starting off with terrestrial ecosystems now a brief introduction to terrestrial ecosystems has already been given to you in one of the previous videos when we actually discussed biomes so this is the very exact same thing where once again we'll be classifying the different biome where we'll start off with terrestrial ecosystems of course we do have aquatic ecosystems as well which are traditionally not referred to as biomes but in our understanding of the entire functioning of the uh, environment and ecology you could or you may refer to aquatic ecosystems also as biomes now what we'll be actually doing is that we'll just uh, briefly go in detail into the different kinds of terrestrial ecosystems that we have because a thorough understanding of terrestrial ecosystems would be when we discuss geography so whenever geography is taken on when discussion on geography is taken on and, and when geography is completed that is when you'll be able to truly appreciate the different features which are found across different terrestrial ecosystems because obviously when discussing biomes i did mention that these biomes or terrestrial ecosystems are characterized by climatic features especially temperature and precipitation so only when geography is very clear will you be truly able to appreciate the differences between the various terrestrial ecosystems and why do you have certain features in these terrestrial ecosystems so what i will be doing is that i will just briefly touch upon all the different terrestrial ecosystems but not go in deep or in detail into each of these terrestrial ecosystems so i'll just complete it but when geography is taken up we can take up all the different terrestrial ecosystems in detail okay so i am pretty sure everybody knows what are terrestrial ecosystems or a biome a biome refers to a very large community of plants and animals that occupies a distinct region with a distinct climate so a biome is generally characterized by precipitation temperature vegetation animal life and the general soil type so i will not briefly discuss uh, sorry in detail go into this because all these uh, classification of terrestrial ecosystems and where they are located or distributed across the globe has already been covered when we covered biomes okay so the first ecosystem that we'll take up is tundra now the word tundra actually means a barren land since they are found where environmental conditions are very severe broadly you may classify tundra into two types one is the arctic tundra the other is the alpine tundra the arctic tundra extends as a continuous belt below the polar ice cap and above the tree line in the northern hemisphere it occupies the northern fringe of canada alaska european uh, uh, european russia siberia and also small islands along the arctic ocean whereas when you compare this with the southern hemisphere tundra region is actually very very small because along that part of the globe or planet earth it is usually nothing but water that is oceans now when we come to the alpine tundra please remember alpine tundra only occurs on very high mountains the kind of flora and fauna which is found here that is the typical vegetation of the arctic tundra is cotton grass uh, arctic willows birches lichens whereas animals of the tundra could be reindeer musk ox or arctic hare now one thing that you have to understand is that most of the vegetation which is found along tundra most of this vegetation they have a very low metabolic rate and since the metabolic rate is very low they also have a very long life span so if you take this arctic willow for example the arctic willows life span is about 150 to 300 years that is the life span of the arctic willow also 
most of the plants which are actually found here will have a thick cuticle to protect them from the cold temperatures and also epidermal hair. When it comes to the animals, uh, you hardly have any reptiles in this region because obviously when we have discussed all these concepts, I did tell you that most of the reptiles, they, do, they are not able to regulate their body temperature. They actually depend upon the external environment and hence you, do, hence you don't really have reptiles along this region. Whereas when it comes to mammals, the mammals have very large body size, small tail and a small ear to avoid the loss of heat from the surface. So these are the various animals that can be found with certain modifications in the tundra region. Apart from that, you can remember few of the characteristic features of the tundra which include the extreme cold temperature, low biotic diversity or biodiversity, the simple vegetation structure, uh, limitation of drainage, short season of growth, uh, large population oscillations and also energy and nutrients in the form of dead organic material. Next, we actually move on to grasslands. Uh, <coughs> I'm pretty sure everybody knows what are grasslands. Now, grasslands are actually found where rainfall is anywhere between 25 to 75 centimeters per year or in some sources you could also say it is about 20 to 50 inches per year. Now this precipitation or rainfall is actually not enough to support a forest but it is more than enough than what is present or than what is received in deserts. So typical grasslands are vegetation formations that are generally found in temperate climates where the most prominent vegetation is usually nothing but grass. When you come, when you come to India, in India they are found mainly in the high Himalayas. The rest of India's grasslands are mainly composed of steppes and savanna. When it comes to steppes and savanna, the major difference between the steppes and savanna is that all the forage in steppes is provided only during the brief wet season whereas in the savannas forage is largely from grasses that not only grow during the wet season but also from the smaller amount of regrowth in the dry season. Now the distribution of grasslands that is savanna and steppes has already been covered when we discussed biomes. So this is just a few introduction. I told in the beginning itself I will not go in deep in detail into these things because it is best discussed when we do geography. Uh, apart from this, I actually want you to understand that grasslands are also of great economic importance because only when you have grasslands can you actually support livestock. So if you take any region or a country, if it does not have grasslands, it will not be able to support livestock. So grassland biomes are important to maintain the population of many domesticated and wild herbivores which is actually important in India. However, the grazing due to this factor can also have an impact on grasslands. So due to heavy grazing pressure, the quality of grasslands deteriorates rapidly. The mulch cover of the soil reduces Microclimate becomes more dry and is readily invaded by xerophytic plants and burrowing animals. Also, due to the absence of humus cover, that is organic content or matter, mineral soil surface is heavily trampled. When wet, it produces puddling of the surface layer. In turn, it reduces the infiltration of water into the soil and accelerates runoff resulting in soft erosion. Please remember these things. Now these changes actually contribute to the reduction of energy flow and the, dis and the disruption of the stratification and periodicity of the primary producers. So it actually results in a breakdown of the biogeochemical cycles of water, carbon and nitrogen which also we have discussed in the previous videos. Water and wind erosion also deteriorates the dry grassland microclimate. 
So these are the few things that you have to know when it comes to grasslands. Okay. Next, we'll take up the desert ecosystem. Now, deserts are formed in regions with very less annual rainfall, usually less than 25 centimeters annual rainfall or sometimes in hot regions where there may be more rainfall but it is unevenly distributed in the annual cycle that is throughout the year. So lack of rain in mid latitude is often due to stable high pressure zones. So I'm sure in geography you would have discussed or it would have been covered pressure belts would have been covered if not again that is the reason when geography is done you'll be able to understand how are these deserts actually distributed across the globe. So uh, coming back to this, deserts in temperate regions often lie in rain shadows that is where high mountains block off moisture from the seas. The climate of these biomes is modified by altitude and latitude. At high altitudes and at greater distance from the equator, the deserts are cold and hot near the equator and tropics. So please remember, at high altitudes and Further away from water bodies or the equator, it can be a cold desert. Whereas along the tropical region and near the equator, you can have hot deserts. So when it comes to your uh, uh, vegetation, you will usually have your creosote bush, your cactus and few other uh, plants like or trees like palm which are actually scattered across the desert. Now, water is the dominant limiting factor which actually controls and restricts the productivity of a given desert. However, soils are actually suitable as they have several nutrients in them and whenever if irrigation can be provided, these arid regions may become very productive agricultural land. Now, uh, here in this particular slide over here, I've actually mentioned the four major types of deserts. You can just go through them quickly. We have the hot and dry desert, we have the semi-arid desert, we have the coastal desert, and we also have the cold desert. So why do we have such deserts? It will depend upon the geographical location of these particular arid regions. Now, the kind of uh, life forms which are found in desert regions will have certain adaptations. For example, if you take plants, if you take the kind of plants that you have in these arid regions, they are mostly shrubs because obviously the amount of precipitation which is required is not sufficient to support a forest. Leaves are absent or reduced in size. Now these are all modifications. Leaves and stem are succulent and water storing. In some plants, even the stem contains chlorophyll for photosynthesis, whereas the root system is very well developed as it goes deeper into the ground in search for water. Now when it comes to your animals, most of the animals which are found in your arid regions, they are usually very fast runners. They are nocturnal in habit to avoid the sun's heat during daytime. They conserve water by excreting concentrated urine. Animals and birds usually have long legs to keep the body away from the hot ground. If you take lizards, they are mostly insectivorous and can live without drinking water for several days. Herbivorous animals get sufficient water from the seeds which they eat. So these are how various animals in the desert regions try and adapt in such arid conditions. Now, one particular concept which is associated with deserts is actually desertification. Desertification is the destruction of biological potential of the land which can ultimately lead to desert-like conditions. So in arid and semi-arid regions, the restoration of the fragile ecosystem is very slow and issues like deforestation, mining enhances desertification. So desertification is actually as of today a very big problem in states like Rajasthan, Gujarat, Punjab and Haryana where in India at least in many of these places it is mostly due to human actions rather than climatic change. So human actions such as population pressures, uh, 
uh, increase in cattle population and resulting in overgrazing, increased agriculture, developmental activities, deforestation, all these things are actually leading to desertification in India. As per the desertification and land degradation atlas of India, uh, around 70% of the country, it is a staggering 70% of the country can be considered to be dry lands. That is the uh, percentage area of India which is around, uh, you know, uh, it is close to uh, two-thirds of uh, India's uh, uh, entire land area which, is, which can be considered to be dry lands. So, one thing that we have actually done is that uh, India is today a signatory of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And also based on this, several programs have actually been implemented to address issues related to land degradation, like the National Afforestation Program or the Integrated Watershed Management Program, National Mission for Green India. These are the few examples. So what I want you to do is that, uh, please do Google and also read more about the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. I want you to go back home or even if you're at home, please do read about uh, these conventions which are actually very important at the international level in order to combat such global problems such as desertification because it is not only restricted to India. Some of the important conventions, I'll actually take it up later, everything together. So I really don't want to get into only this particular convention at this stage. Many of these important conventions and international treaties, we'll take it up later. So uh, forest ecosystems are actually, uh, I'm yet to cover it. I'll, this will be covered in the next video. So if you do have any uh, doubts, please do write to us in the comment section. Thank you.